I think what's more likely is through non-brain-like tricks and algorithms and techniques, we can create, quote-unquote, intelligent systems that will be, for all intents and purposes, you know, as good as a human. And I think once that day comes, it'll be almost kind of an anticlimactic event. This is Brain Inspired. Good day, fellow interested humans. I am Paul Middlebrooks. Welcome to the show. So, models. We use them in neuroscience to model our brains and cognitive processes, including deep learning neural networks. Um, Our brains create models of the world so we can do things and experience the world. A lot of people think I should be a model. Well, okay, not so much. But often we take models for granted, not thinking too much about how a particular model fits in the universe of models. Uh, What really is a model? What makes a good model? How do we understand models? And so on. Kendrick K. thinks about these questions uh, and has written about them. Kendrick is a cognitive neuroscientist who runs the Computational Visual Neuroscience Lab, where he uses models and fMRI to understand visual processing in our brains. We discuss his recent models that can predict brain responses in ventral temporal cortex. It's a brain region associated with categorizing visual information like faces, etc., And his models can account for the decisions people make and how another brain region in the parietal cortex can scale the activity in ventral temporal cortex, depending on the demands of the task. We talk about how his models compare to the deep learning networks increasingly being used to model brain processing. We also touch on a huge fMRI database that he's collecting to hopefully be used as a common tool to compare different models of visual processing. Kendrick uh, also co-founded and runs the Cognitive Computational Neuroscience Conference, which we discuss. And as usual, we just scratch the surface. So if you are into this sort of thing, you should check out a few of his recent papers to dive deeper. Show notes are at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 26. This morning, as I was doing my little gratitude practice, I wrote to myself, Uh, about feeling grateful to my Patreon supporters. This past week, Alexander, Donald, and Al all became patrons of this little podcast. And it's a thrill to know that people are willing to part with a couple bucks a month to support efforts like the Brain Inspired podcast. I say this every week, and I mean it. Thank you. Also, I want you to know, if you are a supporter or become a supporter, I'm thinking of ways to give you something extra for that support. I have a few ideas forming and will continue to brainstorm. I do plan to create a short course in the near future. I will keep the topic under wraps for now, um, but you will have access for free to that course if you're a supporter uh, when I release the first version of said course. In the meantime, if you have ideas you'd like to share with me, In that realm, send an email to paul at braininspired.co, or you can find me on Twitter at pgmid, P-G-M-I-D. So I've been enjoying hearing from many of you and plan to invite multiple guests and cover topics that have been suggested to me through email and Twitter. To become a patron and spend 2 or $4 per month on the show, go to braininspired.co and click the red Patreon button there. All right, enough already. I hope you're having a beautiful day out there, and I hope that you enjoy Kendrick, as I did. Kendrick K., father of two dogs and I don't know how many cats. Just one. Just one cat. Just one cat. Okay. Thanks for being here, and welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It should be fun. So, Kendrick, you, uh, you run the Computational Visual Neuroscience Lab, the CVN Lab, Uh, at the Center for Magnetic Resonance Research at the University of Cold, Minnesota, where uh, you do human fMRI and make models to understand our visual system, uh, among other things. I know, however, that you did your undergraduate work. I guess you majored in philosophy. And the last episode, 
I had John Krakauer on, and we spoke a little bit uh, about philosophy and its usefulness in uh, neuroscience and science in general. You know, and I, I neuro, philosophy rather is what really drove me into neuroscience from the beginning. Uh, I, I was really into philosophy and then realized how useless it was and then got really, really into science. And now I guess we're all realizing how useful it still is. But so, so how did you transition from philosophy to psychology and, and neuroscience? Uh, good question. Although I'm not going to answer that for this for a minute, because I'm going to do a philosophical move on you or turn. Uh -oh. oh my God, I'm sounding like a philosopher now, which <laughs> is you were saying something like, oh, it, it, you used to think it was useful, but now it's not. But the question is, what is philosophy? Because what are we, you know, it's definition of terms, maybe that's, that's really important. And, yeah. you know, what is the definition, what is the definition of philosophy that you're using right now that causes you to say it was useless? And there's at least two, off the top of my head, there's at least two very different ways you could mean philosophy. You can mean philosophy as it is traditionally done as an academic pursuit in your undergrad or in graduate school, et cetera, et cetera. Or you could mean philosophy as a way of thinking and pursuing, yeah. yeah, like thinking about definitions and implications of definitions and making sure that we're clear on logic and uh, the kind of theories we come up with and blah, blah, blah about the brain. Well, see, I think that's the more useful type of philosophy that is going to be useful moving forward. And it's, you know, it's interesting you're talking about definitions because we're going to be talking about models pretty soon too. But but I was into the latter, the latter kind of philosophy in the beginning. In fact, I may have permanently borrowed a book on existentialism from my high school library that really mm. set me down that awful, awful track, you know. Wait, but the latter definition is the one that you started to hate at some point? In no, I'm sorry, the, the former. I, I meant the, the former. The former, right, yeah. right. The first, the it as an academic pursuit. And yes. certainly, maybe we share similarities there because I was a official uh, philosophy undergrad and I was thinking about doing a PhD in philosophy. Wow. And like to the point of I was about to send in an application. And um, I, th I think I tell, tell the story often. Um, <laughs> but basically, I was about to and I was only held back by uh, one of my favorite philosophy professors. And he, I think, had the judicious advice of like, you know, take some time to think about it. And like, is this, you know, I was just a senior in you know undergrad. Like, is this really what you want to devote the next n years of your life to. Um, so I did step back and I guess ultimately decided not to apply. As a, as a philosopher would <laughs> step back and think about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, certainly. Um, so I did avoid your question. How did I transition? I guess, oh, that was the answer. Yeah. I transitioned by realizing there's a thing called a brain and that we can <laughs> study it, which I, which is not that much of an exaggeration. I don't think I, I guess, you know, in undergrad, I, was interested in um, uh, philosophy of mind, so maybe not not hugely off base here. And but my you know background in the study of well, let's use blanket terms psychology, so behavior and kind of theories as to cognition and stuff, um, and neuroscience like biology. Like I had very little background in either, or I neither had background in either. Right. However, however you want to say it, and so. The decision, I guess, on my part was sort of made with very little information. I really didn't know much about the brain or psychology or neuroscience. I just decided, oh, there, people do study it, so maybe it might be fun. And so that, that happened. And fast forward to present day, and now we know all about the brain, right? I think, <laughs> I mean, these are, you know, topics you can shoot the shit over. Like, do we, are you half empty or half full on the brain? And I think... <laughs> I would fall on, we're actually on the half full side. We do know, we, I think we, of course, you can have cranks who don't believe anything about our current understanding of basic biology and brain stuff. But I think on the whole, if you ask people that we, there are a lot of quote unquote facts or things that I think we all agree on. And I would say in general, there's a lot that we know. That's a good attitude. So, okay. So we have a lot of stuff that we could uh, talk about today. I, I kind of want to just spend a couple minutes talking about the Cognitive Computational Neuroscience Conference. So um, I had Nico Kriegeskorta on oh, oh, a couple months ago, maybe. 
uh, and he participates in that uh, conference. But you are a co-founder of it. Was it with is it with Thomas uh, Nazarales that you founded it? That's right. Well, it depends on how you define the found, haha. Huh? But um, but yeah, he and I kind of <laughs> were drinking beer one night and bandied about this idea. And I mean, this was must have been five years ago now. Um, and yeah, so maybe it kind of grew from there. We kind of both thought it might be worth doing and then exactly what form it would take is unknown at that time but we slowly grew the group into um what it is currently so what is it currently just to recap for people who maybe didn't hear that episode uh it is a relatively small conference i think last year there were 400 or 500 uh, maybe 400 on um the the first year there was more maybe due to location it was in new york city uh, mm-hmm. i think we had more than 600 people come so I'm not sure that is small anymore, but uh, the second year we did it, which was just a couple months ago, uh, was a little bit uh, smaller scale. And its its stated purpose is to try to attract people from different fields, like re- actually different fields, like people from machine learning and artificial intelligence, people in what you might consider neuroscience, which is, a, of course, a huge field in sure. and of itself, as well as what you might call cognitive science, which maybe you might want to term psychology or people who maybe primarily focus on behavior and understanding cognition through behavioral, careful behavioral uh, experiments. Um, So yeah, it's trying to bring different groups of people together, which is hard, (laughs) but I think we've made some progress. And, you know, logistically, the conference is evolving a little bit in terms of like, you know, abstracts and papers and posters. And we definitely have tried to um, include um, new types of way to interact at conferences, like little funny events and not just funny, but uh, hopefully productive and interesting uh, experiences that, of ways that people can kind of gather together in little groups and exchange ideas and hopefully form um, collaborations over, hmm. you know, the next several years. So, okay, very good. So, so and this next year, it's going to be in Berlin, I know. Um, so that'll be interesting to see what kind of turnout you get there. What does it take to start a conference. Hmm. It seems like a really big ordeal. It is, but I was about to say, it's not actually that fun. (laughs) It's exciting (laughs) at some level, but it's also very boring in terms of the mundane things you have to do. Right. Can't you outsource those things though? Yes and no. I mean, it comes with the, I think the usual downsides of involving more people in an endeavor. Like the more people you involve, yeah, they can bear some of the workload, but unless they know exactly what you want and like the other, the bigger picture, like there's a overhead to, to bring people on, you know, too many cooks spoil the broth. That's sure. the thing. Yeah. So yes, to theoretically, some of it can be outsourced, but uh, at least the first few years, maybe things will get more solidified and uh, clear. Obviously there are conferences that are bigger and more established that, you know, maybe they have their act together and can kind of, <laughs> uh, glide more than um, it's been, but it's been pretty. It's been a lot of work, I guess. Involved in doing a conference, well, it's it's it, it's um it's it's communication in a sense. Like you have to advertise and get people excited and kind of secure good keynotes to kind of guide the you know this is the type of conference it's going to be, and you know you hope the quality of the content that these keynote people that you uh, invite will be good and you know so you have to kind of network and kind of think of a vision for what you what type of conference you want this to be like the scale like is this should be is it going to be extremely intimate is it going to be huge is it going to be somewhere in between um and then i guess the maybe the more exciting and fun part of it is uh designing what it actually is Mm. and again alluding to like this is i mean the traditional conference is like okay there's posters and talks and that's basically it and maybe a few long talks um, but, um, I guess we had the freedom to kind of do what we like. And so we did play with some other types of events and, and thinking about how they might go and how we might design them that you just sit around and think and Skype, do a lot of Skyping because <laughs> none of the organizers were, um, at the same low. That's not true. There were two in, uh, University of Pennsylvania, I think. Yeah. But other than that, we were all over the place and there, uh, was one in Europe too, uh, organizer. Um, so bunch of Skype calls and emails and interfacing with a, you know, administrative company to make the website, that type of thing. So that, I mean, I think that answers your question. What is involved in making a conference? I yeah. Guess. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's kind of a mystery, you know, but to peek behind the curtain and just 
personally, I've never really thought about what it might uh, involve to to make a conference, you know, or had the idea, hey, uh, I should make a conference, you know. So mm -hmm. that's just an interesting thought process. But I'm I'm noting here advice point number one from Kendrick K. Do not start conference. Okay, <laughs> got it. Uh, <laughs> unless you enjoy it, like unless you enjoy the logistics. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, a lot of it is just figuring out logistics and getting people on the same page. Well, one of the really cool things that you guys do, uh, I know you try to do a thing, a few things a bit differently, and I don't know if this is different, but it's really uh, beneficial to the rest of us, is that you put all the talks up on YouTube, um, all of the uh, visitor, the keynote speaker talks, mm -hmm. um, which well, is just a fantastic resource. So thanks for doing that. Yeah, no problem. And I mean, we're not the only ones. I mean, there nowadays, I mean, it's growing, I think, in general, uh, to be talks being online. But but yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed them. Okay, so before we talk uh, about modeling and, and your model, tell me just a little bit about this massive fMRI data set that you're collecting. Uh, I guess you're collecting it with uh, with Thomas Nazalares. Yeah, um, it isn't out of the blue. And like lately, there's been a lot more kind of data sharing in the field, although which field we're talking about is I mean, sure. neuroscience, <laughs> if that's the field. Um, and specifically, fMRI data sets have been, especially large scale fMRI data sets have been more prominent lately. Uh, the Connectome project was, I guess, the one that's immediately comes to mind, given that I'm here at Minnesota, uh, the Human Connectome project. I, I actually, have you heard of it? The Human Connectome Project? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You've heard of it. Yeah. So large scale heat fMRI collection projects uh, makes a lot of sense and data sharing. Many people argue is a good thing and et cetera, et cetera. Um, <laughs> but that still begs the question of exactly what type of data? Well, type in terms of the type of device you use. fMRI is just one of many devices. As well as like the experiment, if any. Of course, you could argue resting state is not really an experiment. It's, right. It's it's like the anti-experiment, but that that's a huge space to play in. What is it? Sensory? Is it cognitive? Is it both? Does it involve memory? Is it um, resting state? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also another big knob to play with is like amount of data. So do you want lots of data on one person or a little bit of data on a lot of people? And who are these people? Are these people like your gung-ho, you know, cognitive, they, they can participate in co are what traditionally we do as cognitive experiments very well, or are they more real people, not, not grad students and things like that? So there's all these parameters to play with. Any case, yeah, the, the effort we're uh, in the middle of uh, conducting is one of these large-scale image type uh, representational experiments where we sample uh, many, but of course it pales in comparison to all possible, <laughs> the space of all <laughs> possible Im images, let alone movies, um, where we sample a lot of uh, somewhat uncontrolled naturalistic type uh, images and while measuring fMRI responses, there is a choice of task and exactly the trial design and all of these important issues, as well as MRI acquisition uh, parameters, which we could spend a whole hour talking about. Um, but it's one of these types of large scale image type data sets. Uh, there was a recent effort, actually, very similar um, from CMU. They called it the Bold 5000. Hmm. So it's, it's similar in spirit um, to that type of effort. Uh, and it, it is something that Thomas and I did, gosh, a decade ago, <laughs> actually, um, 13 years ago, we we, we kind of did one of these data sets huh. um, on our on ourselves, and it was very different to the one we're doing now. And we hope this new data set will be many orders of magnitude better. But that's something I've been uh, working on lately. So anyway, uh, fMRI bold responses measured at some you know spatial and temporal re resolution. To uh, we're trying to get 10,000 images per subject. And we're using somewhat non-overlapping images. So across eight subjects, the total number of distinct images will be 73,000. All right. That's the scale. So 73,000 is not a million. What it would take to get to a million, uh, that's harder. Yeah. And <laughs> there's, it's, it's a matter of time and money and both the subject's time and your time right. as the person at the scanner operating and money in terms of paying subjects, scan time, money, uh, terabytes of disk space, 
money, <laughs> computer That's all, money. It's probably a lot of sleeping in the scanner. Although I guess they're they're performing some tasks too, right? No, so. we are we are paranoid about that. Like that is one way in which efforts like this will yeah. be a failure. No, but our I'll tell you the you know every single stimulus trial the trials uh, we we require a button press, which is some indication they're awake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and trying to do the task. Hopefully they're and we also have a tabs on there is a right answer at least on the task that we um do so we do have some checks on that but yeah uh, response rate they're not falling asleep it's so far it's been 99 percent was the minimum performance across the eight subjects so they are at least awake and looking at these images and making a judgment so yeah i'm not that's not that's 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 good to go i'm not worried about that <laughs> okay so you're going to collect this huge data set that's uh you know it's a, a lot of data of very good quality and then you're going to uh put on a competition right Yes, that was that's one of the purposes. And I guess the the point of this data is somewhat that it doesn't have one specific point. It's kind of this trade-off of you can do a whole experiment and get a lot of time and effort into one experiment that does one thing. And I, I am totally fine with that. And in fact, many of my most recent papers are more in that direction. But this particular data set that we're calling the natural scenes data set, which is not a super sexy name, but it's mm. NSD. Uh, this thing is more of a general data set that can support many different scientific uh, directions. And this this competition type thing is one of the ways you could do that. You could say like, hey, uh, if this is a really high quality data set that people trust and believe, then you can use it to compare different candidate models of, say, visual processing or visual representation. And one of the strengths of fMRI is, and the acquisition we are doing is a whole brain acquisition, which is not like what we did 13 years ago. Hmm. Um, so it technically covers the whole brain. So if there are, you know, hopefully we're, we're, we can find good signals even in uh, regions that are not super well studied, like thalamus and subcortical structures, cerebellum, um, hippocampus, things like that. Or at least not well studied from the visual point of view. Right, right. So people are going to be able to create models, and, and this data set is going to be open to the public. So uh, people will be able to create models and um, pit them against each other. And uh, are you having the competition at the CCN conference that we just talked about? Uh, we, yes, but exactly when and how, we haven't really figured that out. Gotcha. Just to, just to acquire this data set, let me just tell you about the scale. Um not that you need to get into all the details, but sure. we are trying to get eight people to come back 40 times. Oh, my so, God. Yeah. So that's once a week for 40 weeks, which is essentially a year. Um, and so it requires a huge amount of commitment. And some of these people are, you know, in science, not in my lab per se. Right. Uh, so maybe they're motivated just because they understand how valuable this is. Uh, but not, 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 not all the subjects are like that. So, you know, just ensuring or maximizing the subject's happiness is really important, I think, for this kind of endeavor. Back when we did, you know, Thomas and I scanned ourselves, and so obviously we were motivated and we were not worried that we were going to drop out of our own study. <laughs> um, but nowadays, you know, that's not, at least for this effort, it's not the same. And to appreciate the scale of it, uh, it's pretty difficult to get an undergraduate to come back even twice, huh? And for for what? For any sort of uh, fMRI scanning experiment. I mean, I know for EEG experiments, when I was in um, at Vanderbilt, I was part of an EEG lab as well. And uh, it's just like pulling teeth to get the subjects who are mostly undergraduates just to come back, you know, once, oh. you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Uh, you were asking, I think, me that question. I don't really know because I've never done that type of. Yeah. But, but, but I guess I'm learning from your experience that. You can't trust undergrads. Well, well right. <laughs> <laughs> actually, no. Um, yeah, I don't think it's uh, uh, violating privacy. Yeah, one of our subjects is, I think, undergrad, or maybe even more than one. There may be, they may be diamonds in the rough. Well, good have. luck, man. Good luck with that. <laughs> oh no, don't say that. I, no. I gotta. I, I vacillate between extreme pessimism and optimism. So you'll, you'll make it. I know you'll make it. So that's great. So that um, you're collecting this. This huge data set, it's ongoing, and it's, uh, when, when do you project it'll be collected? Turns out the scanner will be decommissioned uh, in November. Oh. So even if it's not done, 
It's done. I mean, of course, we can port it to another scanner, but there are all sorts of reasons why the data may not be exactly comparable. So I, we really don't want to uh, go down that route. So right. the answer is it's got to be done by November. Okay, good. Well, we'll check back then and see how you're feeling if, if your optimism came through. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I also want to mention this recent manuscript that you've written. It's a preprint uh, called Appreciating Diversity of Goals in computational neuroscience. And this is all about modeling goals and, mm -hmm. and just as it says, appreciating different goals of, of models from different researchers. Uh, mm -hmm. and you guys actually put a survey out and had lots of people respond to the survey. Lots of modelers respond to the survey. <laughs> just one of the in more interesting results is um, people out of all the ratings, the, the most important facet of modeling for people is interpretability, whereas the least important is clinical relevance. <laughs> yes, that, that was, yes, a little giggles, yes. Yes, I, I, I mean, I, for me, that's, I, you know, I, I know, I know we're in the business of helping people, and that's a lot of what science is about, but for me, it's also just, it was mainly wanting to understand things. So the clinical relevance was pretty low on my list as well uh, yep. in, in my uh -huh. pursuits. So it ring, rings true. Yes, I guess. Mm, I mean, why it is like that? Why is clinical relevance weighted so low? I mean... But you guys didn't... These aren't random selections. So I don't... Did you send the survey out to people that you knew, right? So, yeah, it definitely wasn't randomized in any sense. In fact, I don't even know how really how one would do that. Um, but e my guess is even if you did sample everyone... It would also be the loser, probably, but for, but for no good reason other than it's almost like how science—it's the sociology of science. It's like the people who want to pursue this type of thing aren't quite the same labs or backgrounds that care, unfortunately, about clinical relevance. Let's say so. It wasn't like calculated on our parts. Like, why <laughs> am I not in the clinical setting? It, I mean, I just. I started off doing this type of work and I kind of liked it. So I continued. It wasn't like I started at the beginning and said like, Hey, I actually don't care about clinical work at all. So I'm going to go down this other path. No, I mean, it was, so I, it's unfortunate maybe. And mm, things, efforts like conferences and other grant writing and things like that. I mean, that grant writing, well, that that's the thing is it's really important in grants, but, <laughs> but maybe not in surveys. Ah, uh, well, there's what you say in grants and what you actually think. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll be sure to edit that out, Kendrick. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I don't mind. Everyone, yeah. everyone, everyone knows this. Everyone knows this. That's true. So anyway, are you are you guys gonna looking to publish that in a journal or? Yeah, we hope so. I mean, yeah. it, I mean, it's kind of a semi cute thing, but we don't mean this as a joke. Like we we truly mean what we say, and we did do this survey. It's obviously not a official randomized whatever, uh, you know, carefully crafted formal survey, but it, it's, it, <laughs> right. it's, it's not super informal. It was semi-formal. And so I, it, it makes, it's not very long. It makes a, I think, important point. Oh, you got, you even do some principal component analysis, analyses on the results. Pretty, pretty, uh, in-depth stuff actually. <laughs> yeah. We're hoping it gets published somewhere, but you know, we all have our primary research pl programs and so on, you know. Right. Well, let's, let's talk about some of your research here. So, we're going to dive a little bit into the details, not too deep, but um, some of the nuts and bolts of, of a recent model or trio of models, really, that, that you published. And then we're going to bring it back around and talk about models in general uh, and compare it to, you know, the deep learning uh, networks that are so popular today. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so in your 2017 eLife paper, it's called Bottom Up and Top Down Computations in Word and Face Selective Cortex. Uh, and this was with uh, Jason Yateman. So what are we trying to understand in the brain with this work here? That paper was a bit of a, it covered a lot of ground, but I would say the, the main focus there was disentangling what you might consider bottom up driven responses in these particular brain regions versus what's more cognitive. And it isn't a completely novel, you know, general research direction. There are many papers that, you know, attention, attention and how it impacts sensory responses is, you know, long been studied. But in terms of like the modeling world, 
if you're a modeler and like you come from the traditions of like neural networks or visual object representation, whatever, like you often ignore the kind of the top down stuff. Obviously, I'm not saying people don't know that it's there, but maybe you just for the time being just kind of ignore it and just don't worry about it. So this paper, I guess, tries not to ignore it and tries to say something about to what extent can we kind of understand both aspects of how these, you know, sensory and both cognitive uh, processes affect the data that we record. And we did focus, I guess we did want to look at these high level visual regions specifically, but theoretically you could be interested in this topic in other, you know, sensory regions, auditory regions as the obvious uh, candidate. Um, and hopefully I will convince someone somewhere <laughs> to explore such ideas, but also in the auditory domain, because mm. I, I imagine it, it will be a similar story, but of course that's just speculation. But an auditory domain, gosh, I, I mean, I just thought about it, but scanners are so noisy. Does that affect a, an auditory experiment? Yeah, certainly. It's something that they grapple with. And in fact, postdoc in my lab is, that's her primary research area. She does do auditory fMRI, which is not as big as visual fMRI. And it does suffer from technical problems like, yes, the scanner is beeping at you the whole time very loudly, and hence you have to somehow present your stimulus either in silent gaps, which changes the MR acquisition, and obviously that's not optimal because you want the MR data, um, or another approach is just full speed ahead and just play the sound on top of the scanner noise <laughs> yeah. and then think about whether or not you need to compensate for it in the data that you get. Interesting. So in this experiment, you had people in the scanner and you were showing them images of uh, faces and words and you had a little fixation spot. We can, we can get to the actual tasks in a second. But mm -hmm. uh, but the idea is you're scanning them while they're performing one of three tasks here. Uh, and then you created a model to predict the bold response in a part of the brain called ventral temporal cortex. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the bottom up direction. And then the top down direction is uh, studying signals from intraparietal sulcus in the mm -hmm. uh, parietal cortex. So those are the brain regions and how the uh, the task was set up. Uh, so what were the people doing in the scanner? So the common ground to all of these is they were looking at the stimuli. <laughs> As is typical in visual studies, you <laughs> we furthermore asked them to fixate. So keep your and not sleeping. Yes. <laughs> yes. Eyes open and converged on a little fixation, in this case, dot. So there's a little dot in the middle. And that, you know, covers like 95% of visual studies. We, we always ask subjects, please fixate, because you know, <laughs> a lot of the visual responses in your visual pathways are relative to where you're fixating. So if you don't control that, then you know, right. all is lost. Anyway, so um, lie still, lie on your back, open your eyes. Look at the center of the screen where there's this little dot here. And then, you know, then the stimuli come and they're centered on the screen and like actually um, right underneath where you're fixated on. And uh, yeah, there, so there were three different tasks that we wanted the subjects to do. One was what we call a fixation task. And this is, again, not super, uh, this is pretty common. Uh, we asked subjects to essentially care about the dot itself and not the stimuli. The stimuli come up behind the dot, but are completely irrelevant, and they're not asked to worry about the stimuli or attend to it. They're just asked to make a judgment about the small little dot. And so the color of the dot changes fairly rapidly. Of course, you can make it harder or easier depending on how fast the color uh, uh, changes and how big the dot is and such and so forth. But in this study, we deliberately made it pretty hard. And so this little dot would be twinkling, and you're trying to track its color, and you're uh, constantly monitoring its color and we access this through a button box so they can press buttons and we know if they're doing the task or not. So that's one task and kind of the motivation there is it the stimuli that we actually designed for the experiment are completely irrelevant from the subject's point of view. And there were two other tasks. So the other tasks were done in different runs. So like we would set up one run like about five minutes long and we would tell the subject, hey, for this whole run, just do the fixation task and they would just do that for five minutes in a row. Uh, the other tasks were done in separate runs. Categorization task is what we called the second task. Um, and that is essentially a kind of a gross level 
categorization of the stimulus on the screen. So as, as, as you alluded to, there, the stimuli were more or less faces of, in words of various manipulations, and then a few other funny uh, categories, like there was a checkerboard. Um, and so I instructed the subjects for each trial, and they were grouped into four-second long trials, which is not super demanding. It's fairly easy to do as a subject. Uh, for each trial, you're just, once the stimulus comes up, you're just asked, do you perceive a word on the screen? Do you perceive a face on the screen mm -hmm. or neither? So it's a three-way judgment and it's fairly easy. Uh, and that task is not about the dot. It's about the stimulus. So now the stimulus is of importance to the subject's brain, assuming they're a compliant subject. And then the last task, uh, one back task, which is again common and uh, people use it all the time for various purposes, but it's really just, is the current image I'm staring at the same image as what I was just presented you know, half a second ago or a second ago or the most recently presented image. And um, that's the third task they were asked to perform. And so the common aspect of all of these was the stimuli. The stimuli w were identical uh, on the screen for all three tasks. So so why, why implement three tasks? Well, why not do all possible tasks? <laughs> but, um, but so, yeah, what is your real question? In the experimental design, what were you what were you looking at the difference between the three tasks? One way to put it is if what you told the subject to do and what they were doing cognitively did not matter to the data that you cared about from these high level regions, then the answer would be it's irrelevant. But it so turns out it, it has massive effects on the measured bold responses in these regions. And that's good because now there is some sort of effect that deserves explanation. And that's where the kind of, that's the impetus for the rest of the paper. Like there are these effects, but why do these occur? Or how do we come to quantitative grasp as, as to why, how, how to model or describe these effects? Right. I mean, there's a bit of a tour de force here. So you have three models that, I mean, do you just, do you think of it as one model with three parts or do you think of it as three models? I, I mean, you can see it either way. I guess personally, I think of it more as three separate models. Yeah. Okay. That's the way I think of it as well. Yeah, so there's a lot of moving parts, um, but in some sense, I mean, what constitutes a distinct model or not is, you know, completely arbitrary, but at least the three models do tackle very different bits of the neural machinery. So meaning, you know, if, you're, if, if your only domain was sensory representation, then, you know, you could call your model of V1 different from your model of V2, different from your model of whatever. Right. But in some sense, that's all capturing the same type of stuff. It's like sensory properties as they manifest in the neural responses observed at different points in the back of the brain. Um, whereas in this study, the three models are describing very different things. One of them is a kind of sensory model. The uh, Another thing is more of a model of how regions talk to one another and influence each other kind of a modulation type model. Mm -hmm. And then the third model is a more in lines with actually behavioral work, a model of how you think or why you think reaction times are what they are. So a, a kind of a, a decision making type model. Right. Yeah. It's actually the kind of a famous model. Now the drift diffusion uh, mm -hmm. model, which a lot of the listeners will probably recognize. Let's okay. Let's just step through the models real quickly. So what you call the template model is deals with how the the visual stimulus generates sensory representations in in one of the areas that we're talking about in the brain, the ventral temporal cortex. So, w what's special about the ventral temporal cortex, and and maybe you can just describe in broad terms maybe that model. Uh, what's special? Well, I'm sure you've had people on the show about uh, and talked about you know the ventral stream. So, ventral temporal cortex is maybe just the human jargon that we like to use, as opposed to inferior temporal cortex, which is the analogous region and a uh, macaque would be. Right. Um, so this part of the brain, I don't know, the story book story or the common received wisdom is, you know, it contained, it's the last stage of processing. They have representations that are, you know, have great computational capacity because they now signify the content of what's out there in the world, blah, 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 blah. Object recognition, categorization. Yeah. So that's the part of the brain. And then you're, I think, asking, like, eh, what's the nature of the model? Like, how does it work? What, what are the nature of the computations? I think you can, you can see it both ways. And I, maybe this is the topic you want to talk about later, which is like, what, how is this 
not like deep neural networks? Or is it the same? Or why? We could go ahead and get into it now and then come back to it later too, because it might be helpful uh, to contrast it. Yeah, sure. So let me riff on that for a little bit. At some level, and this is maybe one point of view, it is more or less a quote unquote deep neural network model. And it all hinges on the definition. Maybe this network come full circle. Like, what is philosophy? Yeah, I was, um, I was worried you were going to go down that road. Okay, good. That's fine. Yeah. And I, I think it's it's really critical to uh, say precisely the definition of quote unquote deep neural network model that we're using because if you make a claim about X without even clarifying what you mean by X, like it, it's almost nonsensical to argue about whether that claim is right or not. So from the point of view of the architecture, so if we talk about the computations that happen from you know, the raw stimulus representation, people would say pixels, but, you know, ganglion cells or whatever. Um, it is a deep neural network in the sense that it is, it consists of a cascade, you know, a series of quote unquote simple linear filtering type uh, operations followed by quote unquote canonical nonlinearities. And in this, in the eLife model, there's, it's a two stage one. So there's two sets of these. So it's linear and then uh, some nonlinearities and another linear step and then some nonlinearities. So at some broad level, um, it is one. Of course, there's another way in which it's not at all like one. It's not at all like the extremely flexible, many parameter, uh, very complex uh, neural network um, in the capital N, N sense that, ha- that you can train to and optimize the weights to perform certain uh, tasks is not at all like that. 40 layers deep, yeah. Right. So would you say that it's less brain-like, that it resembles a brain less than a deep neural network, superficially anyway, you know, because you have all these different uh, network nodes, the units, and then, you know, passing information forward along a cascading layers? Yeah, actually, that's uh, you're you're bringing up a, a a subtle distinction, which I think is really important when we're we're shooting the shit about neural network models mm-hmm. and whether they're biologically accurate and this and that. Um, I think what you're saying is, given one of these, you know, multi-layer with many units and trained on many images, to that flavor of deep neural network model, there is certainly a sense in which you can point to a layer and say like. That is, you know, roughly like area V1 or, you know, you can you're in some sense trying to model, like create a artificial or in your computer instantiation of the constellation of neurons that we know exists in your brain. Um, so it, if you take that point of view, yeah, certainly the Eli paper is nothing like that because I it, it, it's not a it's not formally. Um, Actually, you could argue one part of the model is like a whole layer of V1 neurons. But but at least the way I'm – the reason I'm trying to develop this model is not really to propose as a, you know, in silico replica of a brain yeah. at some level of abstraction. It's more a claim about what the core computations actually are. Specificity, I guess, is the key point here that makes – the the responses measured you know using fMRI so the, the kind of mass activity we find in this high level region uh, the point of the model is to kind of make specific claims about that as opposed to be a full fledged model of the entire visual system so yeah. that actually links with the modeling goals to yeah. the preprint um it and and I guess the point of the preprint is like it, it really depends whether it has value or not well it kind of depends on what you were trying to do what were you when you construct one of these computational models and they can come in all sorts of flavors, like what is kind of the ultimate purpose? And the, e- the e-life model um, shares architectural similarities, certainly to deep neural networks, but it has a com- maybe a completely different purpose. Maybe that's probably going overboard, but a, a very different purpose. Well, I should say also in that um, the modeling goals paper, I mean, you suggest give advice to, um, to people writing these papers that they should just explicitly state the goal of their model so as so as not to confuse anyone and so that then people can judge the merit of the model based uh, on the goal in in light of the goals of the model yeah certainly um and i think well i'm a fan of just stating what you mean and <laughs> admitting the limitations of 
what you're doing or like if you're not trying to do x then i think it's totally fine yeah we're not trying to do x that wasn't what we're trying to get out of this model and maybe it, it stinks at x and that's fine but it's really good at y and like that's what we think in this study in this lab or whatever uh, that's what we're trying to do i think just being clear it, it I think it, it goes full circle back to the definition thing. Like, let's just clarify what it is we're talking about and what it is we're trying to optimize for when we spend some time developing this computational model. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is, this is the template model just to bring it back to kind of where we are in your paper. So this template model performs operations, things to throw some terms, you know, like divisive normalization, uh, et cetera. And it uh, can predict the responses in ventral temporal cortex. The fMRI bold responses that are the observed data are predicted by the model. So that's the template model. Now, why is it called template model? Oh, it's maybe to evoke some, I think, reasonably accurate intuitions. So the filtering stage that's common in convolutional neural network models is, you can think of as, as, as performing kind of a template match insofar that the weights are the weights are the template. And so the thing that drives the downstream neuron that's using the afferent weights is most activated by a stimulus representation that matches the weights. So it's, it's just designed to, so the, the choice of word was just to evoke that type of um, idea. So the, I guess the intuition here, but like for a face, for a face selective region, if you believe this model, it's as if it is computing a matched template of like, is the current, how like, how similar is the current stimulus to something that is canonically a face? So that kind of intuition is what I think uh, the computations perform. Speaking of models that uh, are not uh, mimicking the brain in silico, the drift diffusion model, which, um, so I work with stochastic accumulators. Um, so I, I've done a little stochastic accumulating accumulator modeling, um, and, uh, among people who use these, so I did research in frontal eye field and in frontal eye field, you see a neuron ramps up its activity and reaches a threshold. Uh, and then once it reaches the threshold, an eye movement is elicited, right? And the drift diffusion model of decision-making is not brain-like at all, at least the, the, uh, psychological version of it, where I'm not sure if I can paint that picture very well in a podcast, but essentially the toy model, um, you start off kind of in the middle with an upper bound and a lower bound, and then this variable can drift up to the upper bound for one decision or drift down to the lower bound for another decision. Obviously, neurons don't work that way, but it's a really good model that can predict response times uh, and decisions uh, quite well. So you want to you just talk real briefly about how you guys implemented this in the in your work? Um, sure. That's, I guess I'm more qualified to talk about that. I thought you were maybe going to ask me about your, my opinion on what you just said, but I, I maybe withhold the opinion there. Sure. Anyway, so in, um, yeah, so I guess we are a bit of a newcomers to the decision-making literature. So I, um, so I, we did a very rudimentary, uh, version I guess what I'm saying is drift diffusion model comes, comes in many different flavors. Yeah. Yes, it does. Uh, yeah. I'm not denigrating the model, by the way. I, I'm trying to just describe it. So Right. So, yeah. Cause, so, conceptually, it's, it's beyond the sensory representation. So, stimulus comes in. Your brain does some processing of the stimulus in order to extract something useful there, in theory. And then let's say that's the job of a visual cortex. Um, but that's only the first step. Theoretically, your brain needs to like do something about it, right? That's the decision. It needs to make eye movement or press the button or, or whatever. So in the, the version of what we did in the paper proposed that very simple. I don't think it's too objectionable what we, what we said, or conceptually at least. Um, it was basically saying the response is in these high level regions, kind of face selective ventral temporal cortex and word selective ventral temporal cortex. Presumably the brain, and I guess we're now we're talking about the downstream, like beyond the, the areas that receive information from the visual areas, presumably the brain is going to use what is observed neurally in these high-level visual regions to make some decision that it, there was, in fact, a face out there. Like, it, of course, to the, you know, untrained non-neuroscientists, it's obvious. Like, vision is so easy. Like, uh, <laughs> and the stimuli we use were not, like, super ambiguous. It, it was... Uh, super quote unquote easy to be like, oh, obviously that's a face. Obviously that's work. Um, but from the brain's point of view, 
it's got to do that and it's got to rely on what's within the box, the, 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 the neural machinery. So anyway, so th- what we did was we took the sensory responses observed in these high level regions, kind of the bottom up responses. Uh, remember the fixation task. There's some subtleties here. And then we, we uh, uh, presume that what's happening is you're using in kind of a multivariate sense, you're using responses across multiple regions, this word region, face region. And we also threw in V4 there. Uh, you use multidimensional <laughs> um, neural activity to, and collapse that onto like a, a a vector to kind of kind of extract a single number that represents evidence. Right now, I'm going to use some decision making. There you go. Yeah. Here. So yeah. now you have some neural measure of evidence according to this model, and then that number is going to determine how long it takes you to decide hit the threshold. Right, the reaction time. Yeah. So it, it's really an adaptation of this, uh, the, the basic ideas behind evidence accumulation uh, models. But in this case, we're using visual responses. We're using actual measurements to try to plug that in uh, to be a proxy for evidence. And we used, we incorporated it and we tried it. And it seems to work pretty well as a uh, predictor of the reaction lines that the subjects may, uh, took to do the categorization decision. So if you remember, one of the tasks was given the stimulus on the screen, is it a word, is it a face, or neither, we did have button presses, so we have reaction times, so that's some data to be predicted. Okay, very good. And, and maybe should we move on to the third top-down attention yep. model in intraparietal uh, sulcus? So this was called the IPS, intraparietal sulcus, scaling model. So how does how does this model work? So the name of the game here was... Given that there are large effects of task, and by task, when I remind you, I mean when you ask the subject to categorize the stimulus or perform a one back or per- perform one back judgments on the stimuli, the fact that you got the subject to do that seems to cause responses in these visual areas to go up a lot. So it enhances the responses. Yeah. So that's fine, but that's kind of a poor description of what's actually going on. So. <laughs> There's two elements of the IPS scaling model. One, the scaling bit is one bit, and the IPS bit is another bit. Uh-huh. So uh, the name is straightforward. Scaling is says something about the specific way in which responses are enhanced. So is it so to put it loosely, like oh, is it just additive effect, or is it multiplicative, or is it some of both? And you know wh- what does that do to the repre- the the visual representation? And so by looking. Uh, and this is one of the figures in paper. If you just look at the data, it's very obvious. One of those things like, oh, you don't have to do further analysis if you can just plot it in a way that reveals what the nature of it is. But, but basically, this top-down effect, at least in our hands when we measured it, looks as if it's a scaling of the re- representation from the origin. So to take the origin to be like no neural activity or baseline activity, and you have, for a given stimulus, that's like a point in the representational space, and when you induce the subject to have these top-down modulations of the representations, it's as if this dot kind of scales away from the origin, just like in the traditional linear algebra algebra sense. Mm. It didn't have to be like that. There are other ways the top-down modulation could have manifested, but in our data set, it looked like a scaling. And then the other element was the IPS bit. So we say that the task scaled it, but what is the task? Task is just some set of instructions you told the subject. So really, it's the subject who's scaling it. Well, which part of the subject? Well, somewhere in their brain, there's some brain region that, that, that that's imposing this effect on the visual cortex. Um, and so we did a, a little connectivity flavor analysis to kind of identify a, a candidate region, and that being the IPS, which itself is a actually a very large region, and there's all sorts of further, uh, more fine-grained uh, localization-type questions of exactly which part of the IPS and, and, and so forth. But for the purpose of the paper, let's just treat IPS as one entity. Um, and anyway, so it, it looked like you, we could use essentially the activation level of the IPS as a proxy of um, how much top-down scaling or modulation is getting applied to these visual regions. All right. So, man, so that was a lot. So that was three, the three models from the paper, which of course uh, people can, uh, I'll link to it in the show notes. So there's obviously a lot more detail uh, to describe, but so that's great. So you, you have this template model where you determine how how a visual stimulus generates 
the cortical activity in 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 um, ventral temporal cortex uh, via bold response. Anyway, um, you have this drift diffusion model, which is the decision process itself from how how the brain uses the sensory information and the representations in areas like ventral temporal cortex to then make a decision on. And you have this IPS scaling model to implement this kind of top-down uh, attention task-based uh, activity. What are we missing? Does that sum it up? <laughs> uh, that No, that just about covers it. That's a lot of work. A tour de force, you might say. It was a lot of work, but that doesn't <laughs> mean it's good work. <clears throat> well, I, sure, but all work is incomplete. <laughs> I know that, right? So, I mean, are you continuing to to hash out it this is, model? No, so without being facetious, yeah, I do think it's a bit expansive in its scope. As I kind of alluded to before, like, I mean, you could do a whole study just on visual representation. You could do a whole study but just on attention. You could do a whole study on decision making, and people do this all the time. Yeah. But one of the, I think one of the goals of modeling, or at least the type of modeling I do, is like you want the most powerful and expansive model you can get. And I guess in this eLife paper, we were a little ambitious. We wanted to kind of, quote unquote, explain it all. Of course, we're not claiming it's all explained, but we did make some forays down to tackling many different processes that your brain is doing, even in a relatively simple experiment, right? This is just images come up and you're just yeah. asking subjects to make a judgment. And even that, despite seeming simple, involves a lot of complicated machinery um, and a lot of modeling to be done. Can we can we step back and talk about modeling in general now? Sure. So you wrote this paper, Principles for Models of Neural Information Processing, and this is in uh, NeuroImage. First of all, I think this is a good paper for any modeler to read or anyone who reads modeling paper or basically, you know, any scientist interested in neuroscience <laughs> or, or AI uh, because you really step back and take a, a bird's eye view and a just a fresh perspective on modeling in general. And you ask things like, what is cognitive neuroscience? What is a model? <laughs> you know. <laughs> but was it this recent explosion in deep learning networks that sort of spurred you to think about these issues and, and fully articulate them? Uh, it's a mixture. So I'd say yes and no. So I'd say, I mean, if you're asking for the history of this, two strands, one strand is, as I have been doing more and more of this type of work. So over the last, I don't know, depending on how you count seven, eight years, whatever. So in the process of pursuing this type of research, I kind of was, hmm, I don't want to say making it up completely, because it you know, clearly <laughs> has a history of other types of papers like this, but a lot of the details and how I like pursued it, and, like what to optimize for and like, why am I doing this? Or what is the value of what I'm doing? So that has been a strand during the course of my research. And I've kind of been over the years collecting mm. thoughts and maybe pet peeves and just making observations of a lot. A lot of this comes from like reactions. Like you present this to somebody, either someone you know, or someone you don't know, or a reviewer, <laughs> Um, and you get reactions that I think in the end are interesting, even in, you know, if someone says something negative, that's also interesting because you can then like psychologize about, hmm, why are they thinking about it that way? Or, or if it's a valid criticism, that's, that's fine. And you can think about, oh, can I overcome that? Can I show, can I make progress on that? Right. Um, and in, you know, these interactions, you kind of learn that people think about modeling very differently. Maybe that was the seed for this paper and maybe a precursor to the the OSF, um, you know, modeling gold and computational uh, work. Um, yeah. And so over the years, I've noticed like people actually think about models extremely differently. And so that's one strand. And the other strand is at the same time, you know, the deep, the, the rush to use deep neural networks. For everything. Yeah. <laughs> over the last several years. Um, and so that was a separate, but coincidental uh, happenstance and so at some point I think the editor of the special issue contacted me and he had seen my I gave a talk at VSS essentially foreshadowing some of the issues at least um, in this paper mm -hmm. uh, and he suggested oh this would be a good fit for the special issue so it made a lot of sense so I was like okay I'll actually do some writing and you know formulate my thoughts clearly and or attempt to and put it down in writing well, I think you succeeded. I mean, so this really does bring us back to 
the philosophy and uh, you know definitions, right? So, so I mean, maybe a good place to start is the question you ask in the paper: What is a model? <laughs> Yeah, I, I gave a very uh, satisfying definition uh, I heard from the reviewer. Um, my definition was it's a a thing that describes another thing. Yeah. Oh, right. Well, you, you're uh, verbatim. <laughs> it's a description of a system is your your loosest definition of a model. Uh, yeah, and I don't mean that tongue in cheek. I, right. I, I, I like that definition. I don't know. I mean, it's very generic, but. I, I personally believe that is what it is I am doing when I do all this modeling work. Right. It obviously has no specificity to the brain, let alone sensory type work, whatever. But um, I think that's, in the end, all that models do. <laughs> right. I mean, you go on to state a little bit more in detail what maybe a cognitive neuroscientist means uh, when, you know, when they're proposing a model um, and uh, in, in practice – that models are generally, you know, have precision quantitatively, uh, and and so there are a lot of these other characteristics that get, get then get built on top of this <laughs> original loose definition, right? Um, but you know, in the paper, so <laughs> you do things like ask why are models useful? Um, you uh, you differentiate between functional models, uh, which deal with um, how the input becomes output. Uh, in the brain, but not necessarily how the neurons do it, um, and mechanistic models, which do address how neurons and neural circuits transform the input uh, into the output. And, and people can read the, the paper for more, but maybe what we could focus on here in terms of like the deep networks and, and the models that you you create is what makes a model good. Mm. Uh, and And your your two facets of this are accuracy and understanding. So maybe we can just talk about those for a second. Yeah. So I guess I decided to break it down into just these two things, but you can of course slice up the pie differently. And in fact, not to, not that we need to talk about the, 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 the modeling goals paper, but mm -hmm. you know, accuracy and understanding nowhere in that is there like clinical relevance. Right? <laughs> so maybe that's even, which is obviously can be extremely important and, you know, um, well, well, but I, you might argue that to be clinically relevant, you need an accurate model and you need to be able to understand it. So I, uh, those are precursors. I think it's arguable. I, I was actually going to say the reverse. Like if you're optimizing just for clinical relevance, you can use black boxes all like totally fine. And in fact, you know, you medical diagnosis, like you have a neural network, you train on tons of labeled images. That's fine. And then if, if you trust it and you know, sure. check it, yeah, it can be yeah. extremely useful. That's true. In fact, and, you know, the understanding is irrelevant. And I'm totally on board with that. And it, it's totally a fine way to go. I guess I was thinking in terms of treating the mechanisms under, you know, of neural circuitry and treating disorders. Uh, right. You know, yeah. And I do try to allude to that a little bit. Like, um, you know, we we get our data and like we sit at our computers and like develop our code. But like, are you actually going to go surgically resect <laughs> this part of the brain, brain based on what you think based on your little computer code. I mean, that's a high bar. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And I would agree to really reach that bar. You got to both be accurate and really understand the parts of your model and that, you know, so that you can trust it. Okay. So, well, I mean, so accuracy is pretty straightforward. So the model architecture, you make the point that it might not actually map onto the brain, right? And, and that's fine. You can still have an accurate model to predict experimental data, but understanding and oh, yeah, you, hold on. I, I want to yeah, go ahead. back up for a second. Um, I guess of the two, yeah, accuracy is maybe a little more straightforward, but it, it is also, it can be very tricky. And I thought that's where you were going with your example. So if you have a, you know, multi-layered neural network with tons of units in each layer, et cetera, et cetera, one way to check the accuracy is, uh, I don't know, let's call it a, a large scale regression realm. So you just take all the units in one layer, say, and just like use them as features in some kind of large scale linear model. And that's totally fine if, if that's where the, the, the way you want to go with that. And certainly that can work well if your, your goodness metric is like, can you find some linear combination of these artificial units that seems to match well some actual biological data? And so that's fine if you define the rules of the game to be that. 
But alluding to what you just said ago, that goodness metric has nothing to do about the architecture of your model. In other words, you could change the architecture, the number of layers, exactly how they're wired together. Uh, you know, you could substantially change kind of the innards of the model while still preserving this, you know, regression metric. And so long story short, I, I want to say what counts as being accurate is could you actually have a long discussion about that? Do you mean accurate in the architecture of your model? Do you mean accurate and just being able to quote unquote regress or predict data? Right. You know, and there's other ways of, you know, representational similarity analysis is like a different way of quantifying a real system or an artificial system. And that's yet another different way in which you could mean a model to be accurate. So, so I don't want to say the accuracy question is super straightforward. In fact, you could, talk at length on exactly how best to uh, declare victory. Mm. Let's, let's not complicate things here, Kendrick. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. But so, so one of the things that you have uh, mentioned, and I think you mentioned this in your VSS uh, talk on this topic and in the paper, is that one of the things that uh, deep neural networks suffer from, currently at least, uh, is in understanding, is in knowing how they work. Now, there's a, a, actually a lot of work being done now to attack this, you know, kind of black box problem, as it's called. But a lot of people call them white boxes or, you know, glass boxes because you can actually monitor every single unit, right? And you can't do that mm -hmm. in the brain. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, what are your current thoughts on, uh, on our uh, ability to understand what deep neural networks are doing and, and sort of the fallout from that? I'm actually not super up to speed on the current uh literature but i'd say great if people are working on um maybe more in the ai field uh ways to visualize and or analyze and or understand the principles the general principles beyond behind these types of convolutional networks or, or the various other types of networks out there I, I think great yeah i mean that's what i want <laughs> so maybe we can just talk about what it even means to understand uh, mm -hmm. a model, right? So you go through a few topics, um, things like, do you know how the model behaves? Uh, do you know what happens if you tweak some of the parameters, you know, the architecture, have you, can you identify the important parts in the model? So there's all these different levels of understanding that you, uh, point to. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess I'm just trying to get a sense of what your, here's the question. Why do you hate deep neural networks so much? <laughs> That's that's not a real question, but deep networks in some sense can be said to be accurate in that they do great on predicting things, right? Uh, but like you said, the architecture itself may suffer some accuracy. Uh, but then in our understanding is where you're where you seem mostly concerned with deep uh, networks. Uh, is that right? It is right. One way I, maybe I would informally describe it, since that's what this is, uh, is. I guess it, it's just obsession with like the details of like every little thing. So either on the data side or the model side. So on the data side, I mean, we get data of all sorts of types, but in the end of the day, we can stare at like one or two data points a lot and really worry about why is this neuron or brain area or, you know, neural population exhibiting activity a little bit higher in this one in, you know, B than A. And you could spend all day thinking about that and, coming up with possible explanations for these two data points. And maybe I'm obsessed with that kind of scale of, of worrying about, or, you know, understanding the data. Of course, two data points on the flip side is really boring. Really, you, you don't want to just know what's happening in these two data points, these two stimuli or these two conditions or these two subjects, whatever. You also want to know 9,998 other conditions and you want to also make sure that your model is doing a reasonable job for all the other ones. And, and likewise on the neural, like not just this neuron, but is this a general model that works really well, no matter what. So to achieve that kind of level of specificity, well, I like that type of stuff on, on the data end. And, but you can also apply that maybe on the model. end. so parameters, these numbers that have to get set in order for some model to actually do something, you kind of want to know, like, well, if you want this level of specificity, like what every parameter does and why and how it actually interacts with the whole system, the whole model to actually generate the output that seems of interest. Maybe that's 
an obsession, <laughs> but um, that's kind of how I think about it. It's a good obsession to have if you're, you know, doing science. So, um, I mean, there's there's a completely different. Let's let's say you're treating neural networks as a let's use the term statistical nonparametric tool. Sure. Right there, I mean, especially if you choose them to use them instead of a more structured method like oh, logistic regression or linear regression or you know SVM. Um, if you're just saying, okay, I'm happy to throw in these hidden units. They do nonlinear things because I put them as activation functions. But at the end of the day, I don't care because I'm trying to say, you know, do a diagnosis or I have sure. supervised labels. And, you know, in that regime, like it, I don't actually care about the parameters at all. Uh, if I'm a uh, put on my statistician hat and I'm trying to, you know, uh, solve this kind of real world uh, engineering quote unquote problem. And that's totally fine. So again, this kind of links back to the goals. Like, but I don't think that's what let's say neuroscientists who are interested in using deep neural network models for neuroscience, I don't think that's the goal uh, that we should or do have. Um, but I just wanted to mention that because that is certainly a reasonable research thing to do. And in that regime, I couldn't care less about understanding the parameters. Right. Well, there, I mean, there are great tools in neuroscience for those sorts of things as well, you know, decoding, decoding the brain. And so, um, but in in terms of understanding the brain, that that is a different question. Using them as proxies for the brain, for instance. Um, so they're not going away. Like deep learning isn't going away anytime soon, you know. So in in terms of using them to understand underlying principles of the brain and how brain gives rise to mind and all the big questions, what is your outlook uh, on that compared to models like that that you're implementing? Right. My outlook is. Maybe not as critical as you're imagining. Um, there's some happy medium. Like as we kind of alluded to earlier, the eLife thing, at least the stimulus part of it, right. it's technically a multi-layered neural network architecture. So it is kind of like a deep neural network. And so it is just one point on a spectrum. So I guess going forward, if you're asking kind of outlook, I guess what I would like to see, or maybe I'll do it myself, um, is to bring in more control over the development and tuning and and bring in more specificity and like thinking about specific and I kind of say this in the in the opinion paper as to like looking at very specific controlled regimes of you know our traditional things visual people like to do like contrast and you know orientation like looking at very specific effects and seeing you know which bits are important for which bits and kind of constraining and simplifying the network architecture and parameters and, and there's no reason that can't happen. And with large data sets, kind of like this, this natural scenes thing, like once you have enough data on the biology end of things, as opposed to computer vision-y type things, um, you can start using the data to, you know, tune your complicated many parameter model, which is also fine. And then, you know, when, if you go down that route, the name of the game, I think will be interpretation or understanding, like understanding which, you know, this data set is good because it provides information about these parameters. And lo and behold, we can learn those parameters and, you know, understanding what those parameters do as opposed to the untuned state, right? Contrasting right. the, you know, maybe pre-trained based on kind of supervised learning, computer vision-y types of things, that's fine. And then you can start there and then you could, quote unquote, train it to become more biological. Of course, there's many details there. And then it's a, a very interesting question, like what changed? Obviously, the parameters changed, and there are a lot of parameters, but we want to know, I think, exactly in what way did those parameters change. So anyway, that was kind of a rambling response. That's what we do here on the show. That's great. Rambling, yet somewhat coherent, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Kendrick, I've taken a lot of your time. <laughs> We've come to the part of the show where uh, that I'm now calling freeze, fight, or flight, uh, where I will kind of ask you rapid fire type questions. Okay, so uh what is uh Thomas Nazalares' favorite beer? Oh. Uh he used to be a hophead but no longer. I don't <laughs> know. That's my response. Okay, that's that's acceptable. Uh what is it like describing what you do to like, family and friends who aren't familiar with it? It's very difficult. <laughs> okay, that's your response. <laughs> <laughs> Very difficult. All right, that's going to be the the audio clip that I'll uh, advertise this podcast for. It's very difficult. 
What's one idea that you can't do or don't have time or the resources, you know, to do that, that you wish someone else might uh, pursue? You mentioned the uh, auditory work earlier. Oh, yeah, this whole sensory thing that a lot of people do. Uh, it's interesting, but we can study pure thought. That seems interesting. Close your eyes and do math or recall. I mean, people do study this, I'm sure. Right? Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, the I mean, we... Well, often you hear we study sensory systems because we know a lot about them. But that seems, I mean, it's practical, but it's not um, a really good reason to study it. Um, But a lot of what we do, like this whole podcast, let's use that as an example. What the heck did we do? I mean, I'm staring at you because I have a Skype window open and whatever. But like I I could have done this whole thing without vision. So there goes vision. Uh, We couldn't have done this without audition. That's that's true. And our motor, like me talking, is a motor output. So, um, but okay, there's that that aspect of it, the auditory sensory and the motor uh, talking. Mm. But I guess the holy grail will be the thought behind this, not really the overt act of making sounds or interpreting the sounds that you give me. It's the it's it's pure thought or cognition, maybe cognition's too too broad a term. But anyway, if we could somehow tap into that, uh, that would be good and come up, come up with models of that and then you know download your brain to a hard drive that type of thing well, what do you think of the idea that um thoughts you know without a motor component are sort of an internalization through evolution of motor behavior does that make sense first of all mm-hmm. and if so what do you think of it seems interesting i i, I think you're something like you don't have to say the sentence that you're thinking but you're at least building up the ability to say such sentence in the future, kind of storing that away in your memory banks. Is that a fair? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that would be one way to look at it. People like uh, Daniel Wolpert and um, uh, Rudolfo Ginas talk about these things, um, that that really movement is the central goal of cognition and that um, our thoughts are, in a sense, internalized movements. Oh, yeah, in that I point. like that idea a lot. I mean, I actually didn't, uh, haven't heard about this, theory or idea before, but I think it makes a lot of sense. What What's something that you've been uh, really wrong about? Oh, that's easy. So way back when, <laughs> this comes full circle yet again. So the first incarnation of this image representation experiment, you know, this large scale, we did this like 13 years ago. Yeah. And uh, way back then, I was thinking, uh, who cares about behavior? Who cares about tasks? Let's just make them stare. Let's just make them stare at this white dot. I think that was a huge mistake. <laughs> ah. Oh, I just had John Krakauer on. He'd, he'd love to hear you say that as well. Yeah, a huge mistake. Like it's unless you're the point of what you're studying is what happens in kind of a default state if you ask someone to do nothing. Although that that actually harkens to a whole nother field, resting state, <laughs> the field. But um, but in the context of this visual experiment, asking not instructing the subjects to do something specific. I think from a kind of experimental control point of view. And from the fact that top-down things can affect sensory responses a lot, a la eLife, the eLife paper, um, I think it was a huge mistake. Which doesn't say the data are useless, and we published on it, but um, but that's why in this new new incarnation of the data set, we are going the other extreme. We're ex- trying to, within limits, tightly control the cognition that subjects are doing while they're looking at these stimuli. And this time you're going to get it perfectly right, I'm sure. Right. Well, <laughs> scanners are always getting stronger and analytic right. techniques will always get better. And maybe one day you can convince someone to come a thousand times in the scanner. Um, but yeah. we're trying to do the best we can right now, a la 2019. What is uh, one trait of our intelligence or cognition that you think will be especially difficult to build into AI systems? Hmm. I would have to say, this is my naive opinion, that kind of linguistic reasoning, I don't even know if that's a term, uh, <laughs> is really hard to do, I think, in general for artificial uh, systems. Um, and I think it's extremely interesting to study that. And again, like what we just did over the last hour, there was tons of that. What's something that you think will come out of neuroscience or AI um, that someone someone might think sounds crazy? So, so, okay, what is a realistic outcome that I think might happen in the future that we may be shocked by? Or, or that when, if, if you're telling someone over beers, they might think, oh, you're crazy, you know, for oh, thinking that. Actually, well, not to 
take your time either. But I do have a response, but it's not about neuroscience. It's about artificial systems. Great, great. I think one day we may realize that it may be possible to create things, computers, and computers with bodies maybe, um, and we may wake up one day and have a thing. You know, it's kind of the train test. Like, we, yeah, it may... And I think it, it, you know, one day I don't know the time frame for this, but yeah, we can create robots that seem human-like in all respects, and I, I, I think we should prepare for that because it won't actually be that. Well, it may come soon, and it, 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 I won't be shocked if it happens in, in some sense. So I, what I'm, what I'm really, oh, this is a long response, but what I'm trying to say is I'm not claiming we will. I think it's a much dimmer prospect of quote unquote understanding the brain and then incorporating all of those principles into an artificial system. I think that's harder. I think what's more likely is through non brain like tricks and algorithms and techniques, we can create quote unquote intelligent systems that will be for all intensive purposes, you know, as good as a human. And I think once that day comes, it'll be almost kind of an anticlimactic event because now we're going back full circle to philosophy. Like, what's the difference between you and a robot that seems like you? Well, I don't know. You're just a thing on my Skype window. I've never met you in real life. And if you're a you know, robot underneath what looks like skin, I guess that's okay. And I can treat you ethically, and I can interact with you. And, you know, as long as you don't do something crazy in return, like, that's okay. I can coexist with you. I think that's a perfect place to leave it. Kendrick, thanks for all the time today. And uh, and going going deep with me in, in your models and in uh, deep network models. Great, this was, was very, uh, really fun, and thanks for having me on. Brain Inspired is a production of me. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling two or four dollars per month. Go to patreon.com slash braininspired or go to the website braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. Your contribution will help keep this show going without any annoying advertisements like you hear on other shows. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stare